Well, hey, good morning, Restoration Church. Uh, it is awesome to be with you. My name is Chris Kretzu. I'm the campus pastor at South Hills Church in Costa Mesa. We're just a little bit north of you guys, and I am truly honored uh, and grateful that Kurt uh, and Katie, your incredible pastors, um, would invite me, that they would trust me to be able to share with you guys today. Um, I've gotten to know them over the last nine years. I was actually thinking about it. Um, we met, we, at the time, we both lived in Iowa. Um, the wilderness of Iowa and uh, no but it was, it was kind of crazy because we had lived in California and then we both ended up in Iowa which is where we met and then God has us all on these journeys and now we're both back in California and I've loved watching uh, how God has used them at restoration and the journey that God has them on you guys are incredibly lucky to have them as your pastors and leaders they are just um, such an amazing couple um, you know we are going to be jumping into a topic today um, that that, uh, at surface level, we might think we're a little bit comfortable with. And, and at surface level, we might actually know the direction that it's headed in. Um, we're going to be talking about prayer, um, but not just about the, the words that we use when we pray, not just about what it's like to sit at the dinner table and pray before we eat. We're going to be talking about prayer specifically about how um, our understanding of who God is and who we are how that shapes everything in our lives, including prayer. Uh, and Jesus talked about it in reference to this reality. I, th I think that uh, in this time, uh, pandemic and face masks and elections and uh, distance learning for those of us that have kids, uh, many of us have prayed maybe more than we've ever prayed in our lives over the last few months. Uh, some of us, um, maybe have stopped praying over the last few months. It feels like, I don't know if these prayers are working. I don't know if these are going anywhere. Uh, maybe some of you have never really understood prayer or felt comfortable praying because you felt like there was this um, kind of invisible barrier between you and God for some reason. And so we're going to talk about some of these things today. Um, you know, Jesus, in the middle of his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he is teaching these incredible things, and uh, he stopped to talk specifically about prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, uh, here's what Jesus said. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to, to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. Uh, which is interesting. He starts off kind of this idea of when you pray, don't be like. Uh, and it's interesting to me because what he's really saying is, I know you've seen people pray before, and I just want you to know that it doesn't have to look like that. And actually, it actually shouldn't look like that. And for us today in 2020, uh, for you, I don't know what your spiritual journey has been like, um, but I think that maybe in some ways Jesus would even say, I, I know you've seen what church looks like before. It doesn't have to be like, it, it actually shouldn't be like that. I know you've seen what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I know you've seen other people uh, call themselves Christians, and I just want you to know, it shouldn't look like that. There's a different way, there's a better way. I think it's a, a powerful message for all of us, but he starts off saying, don't be like the hypocrites. Now this word hypocrites, you may be familiar with this. Uh, it's one of the reasons why a lot of people actually say that they've walked away from church, is the hypocrisy. Uh, but the word is, is an ancient word, and it actually is a theater or a stage word. Hypocrites had to do with actors, because at the time that this was written, for a lot of, uh, a lot of time, actually, uh, Greek actors, a lot of actors, they would, they would not use their face to convey emotion. You know, nowadays we've got like Christian Bale, who will lose a hundred pounds for one movie and then gain a hundred pounds for another movie. And he's committed to transforming who he is into a character, into a person. But at the time, if somebody wanted to uh, be seen as sad, they would put on a mask that had a sad face. If they wanted to be seen as angry, they would put on a mask. If they wanted to be seen as um, scary or happy or whatever it is, there was masks. And this idea, this was what was called a hypocrite. They would wear a mask to convey something that wasn't actually true of who they were. Jesus is saying, I don't want you to pray like the hypocrites, AKA, I don't want you to pretend when you pray. I don't want you to show up and pretend like you don't have any doubts. I don't want you to pretend 
like you are always faithful and happy and confident. You don't have to pretend when you pray. Show up honestly, truthfully, who you are and how you are. He goes on in verse seven. He says, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Now it's interesting because what he's really talking about and, and, and at the time when this was written, there was the Jewish people and there was Gentiles and Gentiles was basically everyone who wasn't Jewish. Now, a lot of times we, we hear this word or we read this word and we think it was just a spiritual thing, but it's important to know that, that it was a race thing. The Jewish people really had uh, a lot of distrust and uh, enmity between themselves and other races, people of other ethnicities. Uh, not much unlike the, the way that some of us are still experiencing and wrestling with what that looks like today in 2020. So there is a, a, a racial component and there is a spiritual component. And, and the Gentiles really were just any, any group that wasn't Jewish. And so there was a ton of religions and a ton of uh, different types of gods and goddesses and spiritual powers that they would believe in because they were all part of different cultures. So Jesus is saying, don't pretend like the hypocrites and don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. He's not just saying that they pray too long, although some of us may still pray too long. What he's saying, and we actually have found historical documents that, uh, that have some of these different prayers in them, but that they, when they would pray, they would literally list off the name of every god and goddess or spirit or power that they knew of. They would list off every single phrase or spiritual idea that they were familiar with, hoping that they would be able to find the right combination to unlock power somehow. When the Gentiles were praying, what he's saying is you don't, they are trying to manipulate some sort of cosmic force to say the right things in the right way to get what they want. So Jesus is talking and he, he is saying there's really, there's two unhealthy ways to pray. The first is to pretend, to be a hypocrite, to pretend like we've got it all on lock, all figured out, all, all buttoned up, like everything is good and God, I'm just here for my daily check-in to let you know I'm happy, I trust you, and I'll see you again tomorrow. He's saying you don't have to pretend. The second way is to manipulate. And I think many of us, not intentionally, but I think many of us, we think that if we say the right things in the right way, Maybe if we have uh, time in prayer every day, or we, we read our Bible every day, or maybe if we serve others enough, or if I write a big enough check, or um, whatever it might be, we think that if we do these things in the right order, then somehow God owes us. We have done our part, and now He is required to do His. Uh, I don't think that many of us would want to acknowledge that. But the reality is that I know that I've thought that way. Um, not intentionally, not because I want to try and manipulate God, but there have been times in my life where I have said the words, God, I don't deserve this. And what I meant by that was, I'm a pastor. I read my Bible. I try and help people all the time. Why are these things happening to me? I've done my part. You do yours. Jesus. Is saying, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't pretend. Don't be like the Gentiles. Don't try and manipulate. I know you've seen things done a certain way before, but there is a better way to do it. I think about uh, even my own kids. I've, got, I've been married for 12 years. Uh, my wife's name is Esmeralda, and uh, we've got two sons. I've got a nine-year-old named Mason and a five-year-old named Arlo. And a, a couple of months ago, we were sitting at the dinner table and uh, we pray with them at dinner table like most people do and at bedtime and, and we try to kind of build these habits in. And so we always ask them like, hey, do you want to pray? Do you want to pray? And sometimes they'll say yes, sometimes they'll say no. My nine-year-old at dinner, he's like, yeah, I'll pray. And so he's like, everybody close your eyes and bow your heads because that's what you're supposed to do when you pray, right? Uh, it's funny, these things that we just, we recognize. When you pray, you bow your head and you close your eyes, maybe fold your hands. Um, and so everybody closes their eyes and bows their head. And, and uh, my nine-year-old, he kind of like opens one eye and peeks over at his little brother, who is just sitting at a table with his arms crossed, looking around at us. <laughs> and uh, my son, he says, Arlo, 
you got to close your eyes. And my five-year-old said, uh, I think I better keep my eyes open for this one, which uh, is just absolutely comical with who he is as a person. He doesn't trust anybody or anything. He's very, uh, he's always trying to figure out what's really going on. And so, but we have these, these things. My nine-year-old was flabbergasted. He was wildly upset. How dare you not close your eyes? You know, there's these things around prayer. There's these things around our faith that we have seen done so many times that we assume it has to be this certain way, that it has to look that way. I have to say these kind of words or use that kind of tone. Uh, I've had people say, man, that person prays so good. When they, when they pray, it just, it has so much more power than when I pray. That is so sad because prayer is not about the words that we say. It's not about whether we are pretending or manipulating or the words that we use. Prayer is about a conversation between us and God. So Jesus goes on. He says there's these two unhealthy, futile ways of praying, pretending and manipulating. Here is the way that you should pray. Verse 9, Jesus says, pray like this, our Father in heaven. He goes on to what we know is the Lord's Prayer, and we don't have time to look at all of it today. But it's interesting because he starts it off with a phrase that was so radically different than what anybody would have ever known in their life prior. He starts it off with a phrase saying, Our Father in heaven. In front of a crowd mixed with religious leaders and, and people who hated religion, a, a crowd of men and women, a crowd of outcasts and the in crowd, uh, everyone in between, Jesus suggests, Jesus teaches that the best way to pray is by acknowledging that God is your Father. Now, he's not saying you have to start the prayers this way, although it's not a bad thing. What he's saying is make this your framework of understanding your relationship with God. He is your Father. He is your Heavenly Father. Pray like this, our Father in Heaven. It's four words. Now it goes on to the Lord's Prayer, which is amazing, and we don't have time to look at all of that today. But Jesus says, here is how you should start your prayer, our Father in Heaven. It's not that you need to start it with these words specifically, but start it with this framework or this understanding of your relationship with God, that he is your heavenly father. He's, he's in a crowd mixed with religious leaders. Uh, he's in a crowd mixed with people who hated religion. He's in a crowd of men and women and the in crowd and, and the outcasts. He is in this massive group of people and he suggests, he teaches that the best way to pray is by getting yourself into the framework, the understanding, the, the, the space of being able to be confident that God is your father, that we should come to God the way that a child comes to their dad. Hurt, they come to their dad when they're angry, they come to their dad when they're sad, they come to their dad when they are confident, when they are happy. All of these ways are appropriate ways for us to show up because our God is our Heavenly Father. I, I honestly think that so many areas of our lives, uh, so many aspects of our faith, they struggle because we can't quite get to the place where we are confident, believing that God is our Heavenly Father. I think if we had more confidence in that, it would change so much more about our lives. You know, Jesus is God's Son. He's the Son of God. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, here's the incredible thing. We receive by grace what Jesus is by nature. So as Jesus followers, we become God's children by grace. Jesus was just by nature God's child. We are invited into this. It's, it's interesting in Galatians um, chapter 4, 
Paul is writing this letter, and Paul is writing letters to all of these brand new churches, all of these people that have just started this journey of trusting in who God is, and this relationship uh, with God. What does it look like now? Paul is writing, trying to give everybody just a, a, a clear, here is the best way to understand how this works. And he says in Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7, But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God sent his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. This is an incredible passage. What he's saying is you're, you're no longer a slave. You're not in bondage to the things that had power over you before. And you're not just free, but you're actually now my child. You are actually now God's loved child. And because you're his child, you are his heir. I think so often we feel like we have to, to pretend or dress up or become a negotiator uh, or try and get things in the right way, put all of our ducks in a row. And we do that because I think we struggle to see that God is our loving heavenly father. We don't fully believe that that he sees us as his children in that way. So we feel like we have to do everything right to earn his love, to, to be good enough for him to hear us. That comes from a fear of a distant, angry God. It does not come from us holding on to or believing to a loving Father God. It's this fear that says, I have to manage God or bad things will happen. It's a fear that says, I have to pretend because otherwise he won't actually receive me the way that I am, how I feel, what I've done. The majority of us, we, we struggle and we wrestle and we approach God in fear, but over and over again, we are told that we are God's loved children and that he is our heavenly father. Now you may be thinking, well, Chris, I don't really feel like God's child. I don't really feel like he is my heavenly father. I don't really feel like he loves me and sees me and knows what I need. I mean, look around at the world, look at everything that's going on, what I've prayed for, what I've asked for, what I've struggled with, maybe even what I've lost. I don't, I don't feel like God is my father. I don't feel like I am God's child. Maybe, maybe you feel forgotten. You know, in this time, maybe you feel like God is not listening or doesn't remember that you're down here struggling with stuff. Maybe you can't get past your own choices. You don't feel like you're one of God's children because you're still holding on to shame or guilt because of things that you've done or maybe even things that have been done to you. And that keeps you from feeling like you are God's child. I know a lot of you are probably thinking those things and maybe other things because I think those things. I wrestle with those things. Those are fears and, and, and things that I struggle with also. Here is the good news. Here is what I hold on to in those moments. You are not a child or you are not God's child because you feel like God's child. You are not God's child because you feel a certain way. You are not God's child because you behave a certain way. You are God's child because he chose you. You didn't earn it. You can do nothing to lose it. It doesn't matter if you feel like it or not. You are God's child. And he does look at you with love. It is not a negotiable. It is the truth and the reality that we have to hold on to. Uh, I think of, again, my kids. I, I've learned so much about who God is and my relationship with God as a father of children. Um, there's just things that they teach me, usually um, my own issues and mistakes. And um, when I think about my kids, they don't, they don't have to do anything to earn the right to become my children. They are. 
uh, they are my kids. And because they are my kids, I hope that they live a certain way. It's my desire that they live a certain way. Um, it's not going to change whether or not they're my kids, uh, but it's what I want for them. It's what I think is best for them. And I think that our Heavenly Father looks at us the same way. We are His loved children, and we can't earn it. We can't do anything to change it. Um, there's nothing, you know, it, we, we can't. It's, it's so important for us to hold on to it, uh, that reality, that place, because we get to stand there with confidence. And once we know that we are chosen and accepted and loved, then we get to say, okay, now I'm going to try and live a different way. I'm going to try and grow. I'm going to try and overcome this sin or this struggle or break this habit or find healing in this area. And I might not get it right all the time or ever, but that doesn't change whether or not I am God's child. The invitation for you and the invitation for me is to become what is already true of us. And it's for us to step into the reality that is already true. It's for us to believe that we are God's loved children before we have done anything to earn it or before we feel like we are good enough or deserve it because I don't know if we ever even will. We step into what is already true of us. We don't have to pretend. We don't have to negotiate. We just come to our Heavenly Father no longer in fear, but with confidence and trust. In another letter in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 1, again, this is being written to an early church. And in verse 4, it says this, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family, by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is so important. It says, this is what he wanted to do. Now, I just want to pause there for a second. It doesn't say this is what he was obligated to do. This is what he felt like he should do. This is what he felt responsible for. It says, this is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. This is such an important thing for us to hold on to and to remind ourselves. This is what God wanted to do, to adopt you into his family. All of your bruises, all of your scars, all of your past. He wanted to bring you into his family. It's what he wanted to do. It's not that he looked down on you with pity and felt some sense of obligation. It gave him great pleasure to bring you and I into his family and we get to celebrate and live that way in confidence. It doesn't just change the way that we pray, it changes the way that we show up every day of our lives because we get to show up knowing, man, God is pumped to have me as a part of his family. It gives him pleasure and absolutely I am broken and I make mistakes and I am trying, but that does not move me away from God. My status with God is that he chose me, he wanted to do it, and it gives him great pleasure to adopt me as his son or you as his daughter. All throughout the New Testament, this word adoption is used. We, we're familiar with the idea of adoption and we kind of think of it as, well, you take someone who is not, uh, you know, biologically a part of your family and you legally make them a part of your family. And, and there's truth to that. Um, but Paul is writing to churches in the Roman Empire and the Roman concept, the Roman idea of adoption is fascinating. And I think that they use the term adoption, that we are adopted by God into his family. I think that this term is used over and over and over again because of what weight it carried with it to the people that lived in this time. And I want to explain to you why that's different. It's not just that is so cool that they adopted someone into their family. 
It's so much more than that in the Roman culture. And I think that it changes our understanding of how God sees us as well. So in this time, a wealthy couple was able to adopt um, a child. They could, they could make this decision. They could adopt uh, an orphan. Um, they could adopt a, a servant. They could adopt, if there was another family that was struggling, um, they actually had the ability to adopt their child so that they could help care for that child and give relief to that family. As a different culture, things were done differently, but this was an option. The interesting thing is that the father of this wealthy family, the Roman father was the one that had to initiate the adoption. The mother couldn't do it. Um, Another family couldn't ask for it. A child couldn't ask for it or earn it. It had to be the father that would initiate it. There was a public ceremony that always accompanied the adoption because everybody needed to know that this child is now a part of this family. It had to be a public ceremony. Uh, the adopted son or daughter, they would share in the new identity and the status and rank of the family that they were adopted into. This is so important because oftentimes I think that we feel or we have this idea of, you know, being adopted into God's family. We're always like, oh yeah, this is my adopted son, Chris, and felt bad. He was really struggling. So I brought him into my family. No, we share in the status we share in the identity, we share in the rank of the family that we are adopted into. It's no longer God's family and Chris, the adopted son. It is God's family. And my family has this status, this rank, this identity. Every debt that a child had was canceled immediately when they were adopted. Uh, again, beautiful imagery there. And under Roman law at this time, a father could disown their biological children, but they were forbidden from disowning their adopted children. Under Roman law, a father could disown their biological children, but the children that they adopted, they were forbidden from ever cutting off that relationship. And all throughout the scriptures, we are told that we are adopted by God into God's family. We are a new creation. We have a new identity. We have a new belonging. This changes so much and we get to show up with the confidence of knowing that we have that full identity and that full status and that full rank that our debts have been canceled and that there is nothing that could separate us from the love of our Heavenly Father. Paul is just filling, cramming this, this imagery into this lesson so that we could understand, so that we could begin to grasp God's deep love for us, the way he sees us. You and I share in the status and the identity of God the Father. In Jesus, you and I have a new father. We have a new family. We can find comfort. We can find assurance. Our debts have been canceled. We can't be disowned. We no longer have to pretend. We don't have to try and manipulate because we have a heavenly father that sees us, that loves us, that chose us because it's what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure to do it. And so what this does is it doesn't just give us new words to put into our prayer at dinner time or our prayer at bedtime. What this does is this changes our understanding of the way that we belong in the family of God, the way we belong in the church, whether it's at Restoration Church, whether it's at South Hills Church where I'm at, it changes our understanding of the way that we belong to each other it changes everything. It's not just new words to pray. It is a new understanding of how we can move forward relating to God and to each other. God is with you and he is for you. He adores you. He loves you. He chose you because it's what he wanted to do. It gives him great pleasure to do it. He does not 
view you as an obligation or a responsibility. He views you as one of his precious, loved children. And if we can begin to embrace just a small fraction of that truth in our lives, it would change so much about the way that we get to show up in our homes with our families, with our roommates, with our co-workers, on our Zoom meetings, uh, in the school year, and in the discussion around politics. It changes so much because we walk into the place understanding we have a new identity, we have a new status, we are loved, we are chosen, and there is nothing that can separate us from that reality. Our Father in heaven. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I say those words and I, I, I hope and I pray that as I do say those words, that every one of us feels something different than we would have yesterday. I hope that as I pray these words, that it, it sets the tone, that it reminds me of the relationship that I have with you, that each of us has with you, that we are your adopted, loved children that you wanted to bring into your family and that we give you great pleasure. I hope that when I say these words, it's not just to fill up a prayer, to make it sound appropriate or something like that, but that it's a way to remind us of the relationship that we have with you. So God, whoever is listening to this, whoever is watching this, God, I pray that, that they would be reminded deep in their heart of the way you see them and view them, what you long for uh, with them and from them, God, I pray that they would have a deep confidence in knowing that as they step into tomorrow, whether it's work or school or whatever it may be, that they can show up in that space, not feeling like they have to pretend or manipulate, not feeling like they are less than, but confident that you have brought them into your family, that you have brought us into your family, that we have a new identity and a new status and that you are for us and that we are your loved children. And from that space, we can understand that we belong and that you are with us. God, we love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.